All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the final Halton District School Board public meeting for December of 2021. As per public health recommendations, we are meeting remotely this evening. I will now take trustee roll call. Please answer as I call your name, and I'm going in reverse alphabetical order by last name tonight. So we'll start with trustee Vidilankara. Uh, what a nice surprise. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, Trustee Rosha. I like the reverse order. I'm here. Trustee Reynolds is, oh, is not here tonight. Trustee Oliver. Good evening, everyone. Trustee Gravance. Hello, everybody. Trustee Gray. Hello from the hills. <laughs> Trustee Garretts. Good evening, everyone. Vice Chair Al Harrison. Hello, I'm here. Trustee Danielli. Thank you, I am here. Trustee Collard. Good evening, everyone. Trustee Bell. Good evening, everyone. And Trustee Amos. Good evening, everyone. I thought I'd change it up a little bit tonight. Well, I Director used to be Wheeler, so I was the other way at one time. <laughs> uh, Director Ennis, could I please ask what staff are in attendance this evening? Good evening, Chair Shuttleworth, and to all the trustees. We have a full complement of staff here to support uh, the board meeting tonight. Thank you. Excellent. That's wonderful. All right. So today I will be honoring the land. And before I begin, I'd like to take this moment to think a little bit deeper behind the meanings of the words of our land acknowledgement. So last week, we were honored at the Halton District School Board Human Rights Symposium to hear from Janice Makokis who invited us to live the spirit and intent of treaty relationships, work towards justice in action, and protect Mother Earth. So I urge you to reflect on this invitation as I acknowledge the land. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern tradition of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Attawandaron, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather here today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honour and respect the four directions, land, water, plants, animals, ancestors that walk before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing your tradition, their traditional territory with us. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of possible conflict of interest tonight? All right, seeing none, we are now up to the agenda. Trustee Amos, would you like to mo make a motion to approve the agenda, agenda for this evening? I, yes, I'd like to, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Trustee Garrett, would you like to second this motion? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. All right. Is there any discussion on the agenda for this evening? Great. So if you can go to your voting sheet and please cast your vote. And that Ooh. passes trusty. Oh, yeah. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, moving on. We have no inspire awards for tonight. So I would, oh. sorry. Yeah, there's no Inspire Awards for this evening. However, I would like to take this time to encourage you all to continue to nominate individuals or groups who support our students and their achievements. Nomination information is available on the HDSB website. 
So as we're on to 2.2, as per our agenda, we have no delegations and 2.3, we also have no presentations this evening. So we are up to the consent agenda items. Trustee Gray, would you like to make a motion to deal with the consent agenda? Yes, I would. Great, and Trustee Grabenz, would you like to second this motion? Yes, thank you. Great, so I'm going to put the motion on the floor. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the consent agenda action items and receive the information items for December 15th, 2021. Are there any items that need to be pulled for discussion? Again, we're using our hand raising if we need to do it. And I'll just quickly go through to call each item in case there's something you wanted to raise. First, we have the minutes from December 1st, the order paper, and the admin procedure update. All right, so I think that's giving you enough time. So if you can go to your voting page and cast your vote, please. All those in favor of the consent agenda items. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now up to section 5.0 ratification action items for this evening, uh, starting with approval of business transactions in private session. Vice Chair L. Harrison, do we have any business from private session that requires approval? Not this evening, thank you. Great, thank you so much. We are now up to 5.2 action items for this evening. We have four action items for this evening, starting off with the identification of community planning and partnership opportunities, report number 21159. Executive Officer Gadette, would you like to speak to this? Certainly, thank you, Chair Shuttleworth, and good evening. Uh, this uh, report has come forward as it has in the past. Um, we've got, uh, I think, a total of 10 schools presented here for uh, partnership uh, as identified in our policy and procedure. And uh, General Manager Thibault and myself are happy to answer any questions. All right, I'm going to read the motion and then open the floor. So be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the list of schools for community partnerships and that staff be directed to notify community partners of opportunity for sharing of space and undertake the annual community planning and partnership meeting. Trustee Rocha, would you like to move this? Yes, I would, thanks. And Trustee Amos, would you like to second? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. Great. Is there any discussion or debate? And again, we're using our raising our hand function. Awesome. Great report. So if you can now turn to your voting page and cast your vote, that would be wonderful. So thank you so much, and that carries unanimously. All right, thank you very much. We are now up to 5.2.2, the striking committee report, report number 21163. Uh, Vice Chair L. Harrison, would you like to speak to this? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, last week, we had the annual organizational striking committee meeting uh, during the committee of the whole process and uh, trustees 
indicated which committees that they would like to serve on for the coming year. Uh, in addition, we have a number of committees that were four-year appointments that trustees will continue with their uh, appointments to. So the report in front of you has the results of that uh, discussion, and I'm happy to answer any questions. My understanding is that uh, through the director's office that the um, associated staff of certain committees will be notified as soon as this um, report is approved so that trustees then can start to receive notice of any upcoming meetings uh, and any other additional uh, requirements or reports. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Al Harrison. Uh, Director Ennis, did you have something you wanted to add to that quickly before I any questions? <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. Just wanted to say we have begun the work um, to notify staff, um, uh, Vice Chair L. Harrison, and so pending the approval and uh, of the board and all the outcomes tonight, uh, we will make sure that uh, trustees receive all the uh, communications going forward. Great, thank you very much. So, Trustee Gray, I see your hand is up. Is it all right if I put the motion on the floor first and then I come back to you to ask your question? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so I will quickly read the motion and be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approved the trustee committee appointments for the 2022 year as outlined in report 21163. Vice Chair L. Harrison, would you like to move this? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. And Trustee Grabantz, would you like to second it? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. I will now open the floor for questions and discussion. Trustee Gray, you had your hand up. Um, thank you very much uh, through the chair. I wanted just to make a comment about the process uh, in which we did the striking committee this year. I wanted to compliment um, Vice Chair uh, Al Harrison for her work on making this a very transparent uh, process, one where we had lots of information well in advance so that we could all make some very, very good decisions. I think as a group going through that process last Wednesday night, uh, we landed in a very, very good place. And I couldn't help but observe the willingness on behalf of all of my colleague trustees to ensure that everyone had um, uh, landed in, a, in a, an area where they wanted to and um, the compliance with everyone to ensure that that was going to happen was remarkable. It's a real testament to the commitment that we have as a group to ensure that we step forward in a very, very strong way. So I want to thank all of uh, my colleagues. I thought the whole process was uh, really well run. And uh, again, we've landed in a very, very good spot. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gray. And I want to echo your gratitude to Vice Chair Harrison, as well as the rest of the team for working so collaboratively together. Are there any other questions, comments, or discussions surrounding this motion? And I see none. So if you can, again, click on your voting page and let's see where we land with this one, please. We are still missing, oh, I think we're missing one. 12, there we go. And that carries unanimously. Thank you so much. All right, we are now on to 5.2.3, the revised budget report number 21164. Superintendent Nagoy, would you like to speak to this? Yes, thank you. And for you, Chair Shuttleworth, to all trustees. I do apologize if I turn this way. I have everything on my screen as uh, I walk uh, through the report. Um, it is within the trustees' mandate to approve a budget, a balanced budget, as well as to approve any use of reserves. Uh, the revised budget is not always an action item, but it is in this case because we do have a request for additional surplus to be used towards the budget. So the budget, the revised budget 
presented today is for 828 million um, uh, in terms of the operating budget. And the um, it, it is a compliant budget with 11 million uh, deficit. So the deficit is going to be drawn from the surplus and therefore it requires board approval. Uh, at the time of the budget, we did request for use of board funds, but the revised budget includes an addition of uh, approximately 5.5 million in further uh, use of board reserves in order to address directly COVID-related pressures within the system, as well as support our multi-year plan. We do, um, I wanted to mention a couple of changes since the, the board budget. Um, the ministry did uh, um, confirm that we are allowed to submit a compliant budget of up to 2% of the provincial allocation, which for us, it's approximately 14.5 million. So therefore this is a compliant budget. Uh, it does not require ministry approval. It, it only requires board approval. We did receive the second phase of the board of the COVID uh, par uh, uh, priorities and partnership funding, the PPFs, uh, and those are also included in this report. In particular, uh, Appendix G highlights all the additional supports uh, from a COVID perspective that we have added to our system for the year. They include those um, for the full year. So they include those in the budget as well as the additional ones. Uh, I will uh, just mention that they will not be the same as the staffing uh, increment over budget that is in Appendix F because that only refers to the difference to since the budget and it only refers to uh, uh, permanent staff uh, or uh, long-term occasionals and not casual staff. Whereas Appendix uh, G uh, gives us uh, ca uh, casual staff as well um, and therefore they will differ. Um, so in total, we have uh, added 166 supports for COVID um, uh, initiatives. Uh, and and um, so that's for about 15.7 million and an additional almost 3 million in non-staffing COVID support that is detailed within Appendix G. So what is included in the 11 million uh, surplus uh, drawdown? Uh, 5.3 million of the COVID supports that I've just mentioned are covered by our reserves and 13.4 million are covered by the COVID uh, partnerships, uh, priorities and partnerships funds that the ministry provided. An additional 1.8 million uh, was uh, approved at budget time to support the multi-year plan. Uh, with these schools being closed last year, there and some supply disruptions and delivery of uh, uh, goods and service uh, of goods uh, being delayed we have a significant rollover in our school decentralized budgets. Uh, so that is 2.5 million that we had to roll over. So that is of course being covered by uh, the um, surplus uh, as well as uh, other um, uh, technology um, uh, implementation and committed capital. We've also uh, brought up the contingency, the board contingency back up to a million dollars in in case we do have other uh, pressing needs uh, from now until the end of the year. So that really makes up our 11 million surplus. Um, I would also like to highlight that uh, the financial statements for the prior year, we did uh, receive stabilization funding and with some savings due to school closures, we ended up with 11.7 .7 million in savings. So this uh, revised budget shows a commitment to use those savings uh, within our system uh, to address the, the pressures uh, uh, and the impact from this pandemic. From a perspective of um, enrollment, over the budget, we do see an increase in the primary grades and the, the entry grades, the uh, JK and SK grades. So approximately 173 uh, additional students and a decrease of 320 in the elementary, in the secondary panel. Uh, but that is as it relates to um, the budget. Over last year, however, the secondary panel did go up about 800 students. So we're still growing year over year. We are just uh, 
lower than what we had projected. The reason the secondary panel is so much um, larger than last year is that a large grade eight moved into grade nine. So that uh, increased uh, our panel for the secondary and decreased um, the elementary uh, panel. Uh, however, we did not meet the growth trends that we expected this year. Um, and with that, uh, I just wanted to, to mention that we are in a compliant position and we are asking trustees uh, to approve a, a deficit budget of 11 million uh, this evening. I'd be happy to take any questions trustees may have. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Superintendent McGoy. Um, I will quickly read the motion and then open the floor. So be it resolved that the Board of Trustees approve the 2021-2022 Halton District School Board revised PSAB operating budget in the amount of $828,272,613 and that the Superintendent of Business Services and Treasurer be authorized to proceed with the expenditure of funds as outlined in Appendix D. Be it resolved that the Board of Trustees approve additional use of board surplus of up to $5,489,582, bringing the total drawdown on surplus to $11,009,338 to address pressures related to the COVID-19 and the 2021, sorry, the 2020-2021 budget rollovers as outlined in Appendix G, and that this does not exceed 2% of the provincial allocation. Trustee Gray, would you like to move this? Absolutely, thank you. And Trustee Collard, would you like to second? Yes, thank you, I would. Great, I'm going to now open the floor, Trustee Grabet. Uh, thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one is uh, on Appendix D, under instruction expense, there is a $4.7 million variance from estimates, and I'm just wondering if you could explain why. Um, so I uh, in the... Text, uh, sorry, that's on Appendix D under textbooks and supplies. Yes. Um, so uh, we do have um, an increase as it results to additional uh, PPFs that have been uh, included um, since the budget, as well as the rollover uh, of the decentralized budget, which included orders that were committed in the prior year. Uh, but not delivered, so they will appear. So at the estimates time, we did not expect that they will not be delivered in time. Uh, and uh, that's about 2.4 million of that, I believe. Um, so that will be reflected into the revised estimates as an in-year expense. And Trusting Reds, do you say you have another question? Yes, I actually have a few. Okay. Um, you know what else on the list? Awesome list. Okay, through you, Chair. Um, uh, for Appendix E, uh, elementary enrollment in Burlington, surprising to me, is up 1.8%. Uh, since Burlington is a pretty stable and aging community uh, with not a lot of new growth, uh, where is the enrollment happening? I understand you said is primary. Um, is it uh, across the whole town or in specialized pockets? Also, is there a surge at certain points? And is, or is this just a... a, a, a people or students that left our system last year uh, coming back? Thank you for that. Um, so at the time of the budget, we did not know exactly where the last year is going to be. And we did see a decrease in enrollment, especially at the entry grades for the prior two years. Um, the ministry did uh, a provincial enrollment um, survey just to see what boards are finding from uh, their estimates uh, and the actual enrollment on October 31st, which is our count date. And what we've noticed province-wide um, is that overall, uh, a lot of the students are moving out of the uh, urban areas. 
um, they have been moving out of the urban areas uh, in the past couple of years. So this year in particular, we've gained some of those entry level uh, um, uh, pupils back. So the gain in uh, Burlington in terms of elementary panel are mostly uh, the senior kindergarten level. And we're assuming that some parents may have kept uh, students home for the JK entry level uh, for the prior year and this year felt more confident and send them to school. Um, we still have not seen the growth that we would expect. So even though we do have some of that back that we've lost in the prior two years, we still are lower on the trend of growth than we would have expected overall, uh, especially those entry grades are lower. Thank you. I, I you can keep going. Okay, one more question. Uh, considering the increased mental health issues we are seeing in our schools uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, do we have enough staff to support students who need help? Uh, should we be asking the ministry for additional funding? Um, I mean, the trustees asking, and can we draw further on local partners to help? So through, through the chair um, to Trustee Garantz, perhaps I'll start. And if my colleagues want to add, um, you can never have enough um, funding and resources to support mental health, especially in a time of crisis such as this year. Um, we are fortunate to have received the second part of the COVID funding and we have allocated additional supports. One of the challenges we do see is that this funding is uh, timed. So it's for this year alone, uh, which makes it difficult to first hire as many specialized resources as we would like in uh, temporary positions. Uh, and also uh, it is concerning in terms of our ability to support our students and communities in the next few years when and whether or not this funding will be available, made available to school boards next year. So that's our biggest worry uh, and, the, and request to the ministry is that they continue to fund at least for the next few years um, school boards and mental health as well as our partners so that we continue to support our students and families. Uh, we also have a million dollars that we put aside in contingency to be able to address any emerging trends such as mental health so, so that we are able to add additional resources throughout the remainder of the year. Um, so I, I think with that funding, we're able to uh, address uh, the needs of our system this year. And again, next year is uh, a, certainly a challenge and we are um, advocating to the ministry to continue the funding and more so to consider increasing the, the grants for student needs for mental health so that we are able to uh, hire permanent staff permanent qualified staff. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to the director. Uh, thanks, Roxana. Uh, Superintendent Nicole, I'm going to ask uh, Superintendent Barnes if he would uh, add anything. Through you, Chair, to the trustees, um, I would just add that um, we're really pleased that we're strengthening our partnerships, whether that be through external partnerships or memorandum of understandings with community agencies. And they have also provided many workshops for uh, parents. And internally, as you know, we have run many uh, health and well-being workshops internally for students and parents virtually that has gone well. But we do um, hope to continue and strengthen our partnerships and we have um, we've been really pleased with our uh, relationships that we're, we've established. If I made this add through the chair, part of the challenge we have, uh, uh, Super, uh, Trustee Grimans, is the fact that we also, as uh, Superintendent Nagoy mentioned, uh, you know, we have the funding for this for the year and it's very it's timed and, uh, you know, trying to get staff, you know, within a short period of time to fill some of these roles is also a challenge. Uh, as you know, the pressure is there. Everyone is looking for staff to support and enhance uh, supports for students uh, with um, uh, mental health and well-being. Sorry, can I just ask a follow up quickly? Trustee Gabenz, before I go, you on to your next question. Um, so with that, I know your focus really has been on staff, but what other, like I know when you look at staff, it usually spreads quite thin when we're looking at mental health. What other ways are we looking at spending that mother, money other than on staff to support our students 
you know, I know uh, Superintendent Bards, you spoke about partnerships, but are there any other areas that we're able to look at where the spread might be that little bit better than manpower? Through you, Chair, the trustees. Um, yeah, the money from the ministry is generally targeted towards staff, but internally, um, our school board and other school boards do look at ways of doing promotion and supports and awareness. So um, that that's some of the things we're looking at. And we are continuing to have conversations to see um, how we can do things differently. And we've invited um, student voice in our conversation. So we'll continue to do that. All right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Trustee Grabenz, did you have another question? I just actually have more of a comment, and this is uh, to my trustee colleagues, that uh, just a reminder that this June is a provincial election, and perhaps we need to, um, you know, make this an election issue to have this money continue for several years. And um, I don't know if at some point maybe we should talk at Committee of the Whole about perhaps forming a subcommittee to uh, to work on that uh, provincial election um, you know, uh, how we approach the provincial election as trustees for this board. Great, thank you very much. Are there any other questions, comments or concerns regarding the budget update, revised budget? All right. See none. If you can turn to your voting page and cast your votes, please. Oh, awesome. That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, we are now on to 5.2.4, student trustee policy report number 21165. Trustee Oliver, would you like to speak to this? Uh, yes, thank you. Through you, Chair, to uh, fellow trustees, um, you are well aware of the um, uh, student trustee uh, policy subcommittee that was formed as a result of a motion passed at a committee of the whole meeting. And the report um, in front of you, you're familiar with as well as it was shared at the last um, uh, committee of the whole meeting on December 8th. A uh, new student trustee policy has been created along with uh, student trustee governance uh, procedures. And um, uh, this also led to staff creating um, uh, administrative procedures specifically related to student trustee elections. Um, so in front of you is, um, is the report that I'm presenting on behalf of the subcommittee. And there is a motion um, that we uh, recommend that this uh, student trustee policy and governance procedure be submitted for legal review prior to returning to the Board of Trustees for consideration. I would like to uh, bring your attention to the student trustee policy. Um, there is an... Um, an error in that the student trustee, sorry, the student senate definition can actually be um, taken out of the policy as there are no references to the senate in the policy itself. Uh, references to the senate do appear in the governance procedures. And that's where that uh, definition is found again. So if everybody's okay with that, um, we can remove that definition and um, approve the policy with that may change. All right, thank you very much. I'm pretty sure I saw some nods of agreement that that change is okay to make. Um, I will quickly read the motion and then open the floor. Be it resolved that the Board of Trustees recommend the student trustee policy and student trustee governance procedure as appended to report 21165 be submitted for legal review prior to returning to the Board of Trustees for consideration. Trustee Oliver, would you like to move this? Yes, I would like to move the motion. Great, thank you very much. And Trustee Daniele, would you like to second that? Thank you, yes, I would. Great. 
is there any comments, debates, or questions? All right, seeing none, if you can move over to your voting forms and cast your votes, please. Just waiting for one. Trustee Collard? Yes, I completely forgot to ask this earlier before we started voting, so it's kind of late now, but I always like to hear from the student trustees on anything that pertains to them. I was wondering if they wanted to say anything about um, the work that was done and the result. All right, Trustee Vigilankara. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, Kate, uh, Trustee Bao, please do add on if I if I miss anything. Um, uh, Trustee Bao and I did have the opportunity to uh, obviously be part of the subcommittee, um, and we reviewed the policy as well as the governance procedure. But most importantly, we offered an opportunity for the student senate to review this procedure. Um, and one of the biggest questions that we asked them was, does this policy perhaps um, create any unintentional barriers to becoming a student trustee or putting your name forward for the position of student trustee? We felt it was really important to address any um, potential equity barriers. Um, our senators approved of the, of the, the policies. Uh, we didn't see any uh, like blocks to uh, becoming a student trustee. Uh, I would say it was thoroughly reviewed and, and Trustee Bao and I both wholeheartedly support uh, the policy and the governance procedure. Thank you so much for that statement. It means uh, a lot to hear from our student trustees, especially when it comes to issues that pertain to students. Thanks. Trustee Bao, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think Trustee Willa and Cara put it perfectly, but yes, one of the biggest questions we were asking was looking for barriers in um, and we couldn't find any. So I think everything looks great and we're very happy with like the results. Great, thank you so much. We, I don't know if my is just not catching up, but we look like we're still waiting for one vote. Uh, Chair Shuttleworth. Yes. Um, the one vote is from uh, Trustee Grabentz and she's having technical, it, okay, she's back. Okay. So she'll, okay. Trustee Gravetz, how do you want to vote on this? Sorry. I am in favor. Awesome. So that carries, oh, that carries you out of the sleep. Thank you very much. All right, we are now on to communications from the board. Uh, 6.1 is the student trustee report. Trustee Vigilankara and Trustee Bao, do you have a report for us this evening? Yes, we do. Oh, trustee, or sorry, <laughs> Director Ennis, are you just on to watch? Yes. To, su to support. The support. Wonderful. All right. Trustee Bauer and Vigilankara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to see everyone again. Uh, we had our third student senate meeting last night, and I'm really excited to share that we passed our first motion, and I guess you could kind of call it a policy. Um, the student senate approved of our norms document, and we're really proud of how it turned out. Senators demonstrated great collaboration, critical thinking, and reflection when developing these norms. And we think that the guidelines that we've set really reflect the inclusive, safe, and equitable spirit and environment that we strive to foster on the Senate. Special thank you to System Principal Shalita Walker, uh, Instructional Program Leader Karamjeet Sangha Bosland, and Instructional Program Leader Aaron Walsh for supporting us through this process. And of course, all our staff and, and trustee mentors as well. 
Uh, we also began goal setting for the year. We offered senators the opportunity to share the feedback that they've been receiving from students at their schools. During both the elementary and secondary sessions, we had really fruitful and productive discussions about the feedback and possible initiatives that the Senate could run this year. Some of the topics that were raised include bringing more awareness to well-being resources like social workers and CYCs in schools, the misuse and vandalism of menstrual hygiene products in elementary schools, concerns around accountability in schools, and anti-bullying. Now that we have our Senate subcommittees, we can delegate a lot of these ideas and initiatives that we've been developing to those committees to focus on. We also shared the draft version of the student trustee elections AP with secondary senators. This is a procedure which Associate Director Bogue and the senior team have been working on. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time to review it together as a large group, but we have asked that secondary senators review the document on their own, um, and then we'll review it together and share feedback with the senior team as soon as possible. Moving on to our joint session, uh, for the first half of the joint session, e uh, Chair of the EMT, Suzanne Burwell, joined us and discussed the climate emergency declaration with the help of our two Senate EMT reps, Ambika and Caitlin. She also shared updates on the status of the Student Environmental Excellence Award. This award is a Senate-driven initiative, and we're hoping to have the applications for the award open next year. During the latter half of the joint session, we were pleased to welcome Director Ennis, Superintendent Etoff, and Manager of Research and Accountability. Accountability, Dr. Pichelia. Uh, they shared the student voices report and it was really well received by our senators. They engaged in some really great discussions and they're very keen to share the report and the presentation with students at their schools. I will now pass it off to Trustee Bao for some final updates. Thank you, Trustee Winalankara. After reading and reviewing several wonderful applications for our, our Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy Advisory Committee rep position, Trustee Winalankara and I are very happy to announce that our secondary rep for this year will be Cindy Wang. We are still in the process of choosing our second, uh, our elementary representative. During our goal setting open floor discussion, we also heard from senators from Dr. Frank J. Hayden Secondary School and Nelson High School talk about their school's walkouts in regards to the school the way the school administration have handled issues of student mental health, well-being, racism, and more. A reoccurring topic we have been discussing in the secondary session was transparency and accountability in procedures. In the new year, we hope to meet with Director Ennis, Associate Director Bogue, and some senators to talk about these student walkouts and how we can improve communication with the entire student population to reduce these events. Before our next Senate meeting, Trustee Willing Carr and I hope to have our Student Senate Executive Committee and Subcommittee co-chairs picked. And at our next Senate meeting, we hope to pass a motion for our Senate goals for the school year. Thank you for listening to our Student Trustee Report this evening, and we are happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you so much. I'm looking to the hand up list to see if anybody has any questions. Okay, I have one question. So uh, you spoke about your norms document that you've created and I'm just wondering, um, how are you going to have it on display for people to refer to? How are you going to ensure that it, it works? Okay. Either or both. Trust me, <laughs> would you like to take that? Um, well, sure. Okay. So yeah, we will definitely post it and have it up somewhere so that everyone, all our senators can see it and refer back to it throughout the school year, because I think it's really important that we have these goals set so they have this and we have our norms set. So yeah, uh, Trustee Willing Cry, if you want to add on. I know we had discussed, uh, I think it might have been at a board meeting, perhaps adding a creative element to this. So like with the MYP, there's that art piece. Um, so I think we, we have asked uh, some senators if they'd like to create maybe a, a graphic design or something that's really nice and a, like an attractive visual to maybe post on our student senate classroom and have it there as a reminder of, of, of the norms. Oh, well, that would be great. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions for our two student trustees? All right, thank you so much for your report. Uh, and we will now move on to the next piece, but thank you very much. Okay, we are now on to action items for January the 5th. And currently there are no action items for this date. Uh, now we will look at information reports for today, which is December 15th. And we have two, uh, 6.3.1, 6.3.2, 6.3.3, 6.3.4, 
The process review regarding the school year calendar development, report number 21158, uh, Associate Director Bogue or Superintendent Etoff, would either of you like to speak to this? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll maybe start and Superintendent Etoff uh, can uh, jump in and certainly we're both happy to answer questions for trustees. Uh, trustees uh, requested this report, which was really to uh, discuss the uh, development process for the school year calendar, um, the communication pieces that are connected to it, and then accommodations for both staff and students um, when a faith day falls uh, within the school year. Um, and so we've tried to share that information for trustees and uh, Superintendent Etoff or myself would be happy to answer any questions that trustees have. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm looking to the list. Does anybody have any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for that information and we look forward to it coming back to the board, I think, yes? Or just for information? This report is for information, but we will be back to the board before we know it with uh, recommendations around next year's school count. Uh, school year count. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. We are now on to 6.3.2, Milton Southwest, number two, redirection. Report number 21160, uh, Superintendent Newton, Newton and Executive Officer Gadet. Do either of you have anything you'd like to speak to this evening? Thank you, uh, Chair Shuttlesworth. Um, we are also inviting uh, Manager uh, Tebow uh, to this report as he was uh, very much the mastermind uh, be, uh, pulling a lot of pieces together. Um, as you'll notice in the report uh, for information, Milton number 11 will be opening in September, 2023. Um, and those pieces, uh, Superintendent Godot is working on that as well. Um, but in the meantime, we have 500 students that are potentially being housed in other schools in Milton, as well as newcomers moving to what is known as the Milton 12 boundary. We are um, redirecting those students to go to Milton number 11, which is opening um, under the principalship of Brian Slemko. Uh, September 2022. So it will be a holding school there and students will get to develop a sense of belonging and a sense of community. And then we'll move all together uh, in Milton uh, number 12 on site for September 2023. The other highlight that we really like is um, that together Milton 11 and Milton 12 together will formulate a population size of approximately 700 students. And this is a healthy size for an elementary school as a startup in building a sense of community. So um, we're really pleased to bring this report this evening. And I will now turn it over to Superintendent uh, Godot or Manager Thibault to add. And seeing no comments from the gentleman, I will turn it back to the chair. Thank you so much. You did such a great job, Superintendent Newton. They were happy with your overview. Can I ask if anybody has any questions? Trustee Garrett. Thank you so much. It's uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, I've read the report several times because it was um, it was lengthy and uh, very involved, uh, and it was extremely well thought through. And I think we're doing the kids uh, the best justice that we can, given that we're, you know, behind the eight ball, um, not HDSB's fault on that, uh, as we all know. Um, and uh, so thank you very much. I, I think this is um, the best scenario in a not great scenario. Uh, and I think it looks really um, closely at, at the town of Milton is a very close knit community and it will just keep building and, and help develop the community, uh, putting the two schools together for the short period of time instead of spreading them all over the place. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Vice Chair L. Harrison. Yes, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. The situation in 
Milton seems to be ever changing uh, due to that rapid growth and what communications mechanisms are being utilized to convey this information to uh, families and students. I know for me, um, I've, I'm finding it to be a complicated scenario. So I hope we can do things to help people through the process. So to answer the question, uh, Trustee Al Harrison, uh, through the chair, um, Margo Shuttlesworth, um, the communications department works with us uh, very tightly along with the planning department. And uh, the easiest step, I suppose, is that you can put your address when moving into an area uh, into a, a really great website that the planning department has developed to give you direction in terms of the school um, as a first piece of information. But certainly um, we are keeping all of our schools um, informed that are in that neighborhood, particularly Viola Desmond, Boyne, and Jay MacArthur. Th those principal teams there and the families do communicate uh, pieces out. And in addition, uh, try to build a sense of calmness too, to ensure families uh, that when they're moving, um, that uh, they will be going uh, into other great schools and good uh, good administrative staff teams there as well. So we, I would say, probably over communicate um, and communicate early in making that happen. Thank you, Superintendent Newton. Does that answer your question, Vice Chair Harrison, or did you have a follow up? You're all good. Awesome, great. Thank you so much for the information. All right, we are now on to 6.4, notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion for this evening? Trustee Oliver. Uh, yes, uh, thank you through you chair to fellow trustees. As you recall at the, um, I guess it was December 1st, uh, meeting of the board of trustees, I brought to your attention an issue um, pertaining to um, an error that occurred uh, with respect to an invitation of the girls basketball team from TA Blakelock uh, to the offset championships. Um, I know that uh, Trustee L. Harrison is very familiar with this uh, issue as that is her um, school in her area. And, um, you know, we, we did want to address um, the error that occurred, the way that um, it was handled, and the very negative impact that it had on the athletes in question. Uh, and we feel that it's um, uh, important to ask that um, OFSA consider its, um, its policies and procedures and that they um, inspect how such an error could occur leading to, um, to a withdrawal of the team from the OFSA championship, um, resulting in great stress, as you can imagine, and disappointment for, for, the, uh, for the team. So I do have an, a motion prepared, and uh, I'd be happy to read it. And maybe uh, this trustee L. Harrison want to add anything to this? Nope, okay. Okay, I, I do want to thank Trustee L. Harrison and Trustee Jean Gray for um, for all their assistance with the drafting of this motion. Um, and uh, yep, I look forward to sharing that with you and see what you think. All right, thank you. Did you want? Are you just going to craft it further, or did you want to look at it uh, this evening? I believe it is. Um, we have a, a final draft prepared that I'm prepared to share with you. Okay. Okay, sorry, Trustee Oliver, go ahead. I'm having trouble getting to my mic. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Whereas the Thomas A. Blakelock High School, TAB, AA girls basketball team was offered additional entry into the November 19, 2021 Ontario Federation of School Athletic Associations, OFSA, basketball championships, championship. And whereas OFSA advised TAB coaches, 
The team's additional entry was made an error on part of OFSA, subsequently resulting in a last minute withdrawal of TAB from the OFSA Basketball Championship Tournament. And whereas the news of the withdrawal of TAB from the OFSA Basketball Championships had a significant negative impact on the members of the team at a time when all students have endured countless pandemic related challenges. And whereas OFSA holds a critical provincial role related to excellence in student sport, which is reflected in its vision to be a leader in the development of the student well-being and its mission to foster student success and enrich education through school sports. And whereas OFSA indicated that its constitution, bylaws, and operating procedures presented barriers to allowing Thomas A. Blakelock to continue in the provincial tournament, Therefore, be it resolved that the HDs be direct the chair to write a letter to request that OFSA review its constitution, bylaws, and operating procedures, and make any necessary revisions to ensure that a process exists to enable expedient remedies of any future errors by the organization that negatively impact student dignity and well-being, and that OFSA demonstrates upholding its own vision and mission by providing transparency in this review process, by, convey, by conveying any resulting changes to member schools so that the HDSB students, staff, and community can be confident that this negative experience resulted in positive change for all student athletes and those that support them. And I so move. All right, thank you, Trustee Oliver. Uh, Trustee Daniele. Thank you. I'm sorry, but that was an incredibly long verbal motion. Could it please be sent to us so that we can actually see it? I want to make sure I have all the details before I commit any vote. I can do that for you right now, Trustee. Thank you. And, and in future, if I could please request that if you know a motion is coming, please send it to trustees ahead of time so that we do have the opportunity to well, look at it and be able to speak to it. Thank you. Yes, and I actually did include it into the document, and I'm sorry, I should have stated that at the beginning. It is in there. And it was... We don't often go back to the document, so if you could please email it out ahead of time, that would be much more helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Trustee Daniele, I just sent it, I copied it from the document and sent it to you. Uh, Trustee Al Harrison. Perfect. Yes, thank you, uh, three Madam Chair, and I will create some some space uh, for trustees who may not have read it yet to be able to do so. Um, thank you, Trustee Oliver, for putting this motion on the floor. I, if there's a seconder still required, I will do that. Uh, procedurally, we need to wait to suspend the rules before putting such a motion on the floor because this um, has not been previously in an agenda. We can't just do it on the fly. We have to suspend the rules. All right, so Trusty Collard, can we retroactively suspend the rules now? And then my question is, as I was asking Vice Chair Al Harrison, as this is a motion, does this not need to come back to the board a second time? I'm asking a question for him. From so, um, it's not retroactive at all. It's we are suspending the rules, which is something we have to vote on. And then um, it doesn't have to come back a second time. That's the whole reason for suspending the rules. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Manager Gortmaker. Sorry, Madam Chair. May I suggest also that as this is a notice of motion item on the agenda, that uh, Trustee Oliver may want to hold off until you get to trustees' questions and comments. Notices of motion on an agenda are traditionally for items coming to a future board meeting agenda. Okay, so... Uh, Trustee Oliver, would you like to stick a pin in this until we get to trustee and comments and we'll come back 
to it at that point in time. And that might also give everybody a chance to have a, a once over of it to see what they're thinking about it. Does that sound okay? Great, okay, so we'll leave that for a few moments and we will move on to 6.5, which is the director's report. Director Ennis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Shuttleworth, and good evening once again, trustees. Uh, this evening, I hope that you find helpful uh, the document that was provided with the items that we will be discussing. There might be uh, some additions. Uh, as uh, Trustee uh, Chair L. Harrison said earlier, it's not perfect at the moment, but we are certainly trying uh, to be as responsive as possible. Uh, so the first three items that we have on the agenda, vaccination compliance, mask uh, protocols, and uh, testing. I'm gonna ask uh, Superintendent uh, Taha and, uh, and Superintendent Blackwell if they would speak to these items. Thank you, uh, Director Ennis. Through you, uh, Madam Chair Shuttleworth, to uh, the rest of the board. Uh, our board website reveals our vaccination data as of December 3rd. I uh, can update you on those numbers as of this morning. Uh, with respect to our overall vaccination rates, uh, 95, sorry, 90% 90 of our staff are fully vaccinated. I'm speaking to the entire district. Uh, with respect to uh, staff who are permanent, or long-term occasional staffs, our, our vaccination rates are 95.7%, slightly uh, uh, above the uh, data reported on our board website as of December 3rd. So again, heading always in the right direction with respect to these numbers. Uh, in terms of staff who are unvaccinated, who work directly with students, uh, we have 221 staff who are uh, either unvaxxed or uh, have not disclosed their status. And that is a percentage of 2% of the, our entire population, which again is, is a good number uh, relative to other districts. Uh, what I can report to you also with respect to the compliance of uh, rapid testing compliance over the holidays, the direction we are given from public health and the Ministry of uh, Ed is that uh, staff who are returning to work on January 3rd, they must complete a rapid test at, uh, no earlier than 48 hours from returning to work. So that would be January 1st. However, if you are continuing to work over the holidays in our buildings, you are to continue to provide uh, three uh, rapid test results. And finally, uh, with respect to booster uh, booster shots, uh, uh, the announcement has been made that uh, they are now available. In terms of the policy for the purpose of the protocol, uh, we have not been given any direction in terms of what the booster shots, uh, how they fit into the policy and the requirements. So it's status quo and that is two doses to be considered fully vaccinated. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you and very much, Superintendent Taha. Does anyone have any questions? I have one question, um, Superintendent Taha, so I don't know if this would be for you or Superintendent Blackwell, so I'll direct it to the director. Uh, and he can direct it to who it goes to. So I'm just wondering, so you brought up the idea of booster shots. I'm wondering if there has been any direction from the ministry, if you recall back around spring break, uh, priority was given to teachers for receiving the booster shots. I don't know, and again, I don't know what the situation is right now as far as demand for booster shots, but are we aware if there will be any priority given to teachers in getting their booster shots? Go ahead, uh, Superintendent Blackwell. Uh, through the chair to the chair. Um, the announcement, and I'm just hearing it as well, probably as, as Superintendent Taha. Um, the announcement was, I believe that 18 year old and up will be available to start booking uh, within the next few days. So that covers our staff. So anyone that wants them will get them. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions before we allow them to continue on? Great, Director. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. Uh, Superintendent Blackwell, could you speak to uh, testing kits for students, please? Sure, uh, to the trustees, uh, through the chair to all trustees. Uh, as you're very much aware, we are sending home this week uh, rapid antigen test kits with every student that is in person in our board. 
Uh, we received them last week and they were shipped accordingly to every school uh, to cover those, uh, the numbers within each school. Uh, we have also shared some communication. I know that schools have been very helpful and also uh, messaging. There are now uh, videos that are available on our website. Uh, we have links to it. We've provided that information to families in terms of how to administer the kits. Uh, they are now available in multiple languages. So there's great resources for families. Uh, the rapid antigen tests, uh, again, just a reminder to families that these are not PCR tests. So if a rapid antigen test has a positive result, then you would go and seek a PCR test. Um, and a reminder as well that when we're back from, as we do every uh, day, when we're back from break, uh, schools or everybody in the staff, every student uh, is asked to validate or verify their school screening tool. And there is a section in there that talks about rapid antigen tests. Uh, it is a question, so it prompts staff and students what to do uh, should they get a positive result in a rapid antigen test. And I just wanted to clarify, I know that we have had some questions from um, the public re requesting um, a rapid antigen tests for remote learners. Uh, we were provided information and uh, supply uh, from the Ministry of Education uh, for in-person learners only at this time. And if you haven't received them, they're coming home this week. Uh, Trustee Collard. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, through you to the director. I uh, had to call Superintendent Blackwell earlier today because I received a phone call from a parent who was very concerned that because her children are learning remotely, they're not being given these um, antigen tests and um, for their family, for the peace of mind for family gatherings during the winter break, she's very concerned now that getting together with family may be something that's unwise for them to do because her children cannot then test unless they pay $40 per test for the family to to have them and uh, as she said for for that family during the, the period of of the winter break that would cost their family four hundred dollars and it's four hundred dollars that they don't have um, i am concerned that there's an inequity here as i know that staff also were not given these tests to take home so that they can test themselves during the break and um I, I, I believe that um, at this point in time, I would like to consider writing a letter to the ministry um, and to the premier regarding the inequity of providing tests only to in-person learners, knowing that it's too late now for them to be provided through the school system, but they could be provided at central locations, such as places that provide vaccines, at no charge to the families. Um, it, there, there needs to be something for these families to feel peace of mind during the, the, the break when they are more than likely wanting to see other family members and, and don't want to put anyone at risk. So I'm looking for, I guess, um, some comments from the other trustees around the table as to whether or not uh, they would support such a letter, because I think there, there are a number of things that I would like to see letters written about, but um, th this one really bothers me because it, it is inequitable. So um, one thing I just wanted to, so I just received an email and I think it was brought up earlier, but I did want to also uh, note attention to the fact that there are free rapid testing pop-up locations coming up. I don't know, uh, Superintendent Blackwell, I don't know if you know anything about this. I know you did a little dance earlier, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, through the chair uh, to Trustee Collard and, and all other trustees, I, uh, you know, just listening to the news this afternoon from coming from one meeting to another, 
uh, back to the board meeting, I believe that uh, there is a strategy in place to address that, Trustee Collard. Uh, the ministry made an announcement today, uh, different places that uh, anyone can access rapid testing kits. I don't have Are all they the free, though? I believe they're free, yes. yes I didn't hear free. the word free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, can just... I think between when we spoke earlier today and then post just before this meeting, the, the world changed. The world changed. So, so someone was listening to our conversation. Possible. Possible. <laughs> Google hears everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Letter is not required now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Trustee Collard, I just sent you an email. Um, are there any, oh, Trustee Gray. Um, thank you very much through the chair and in response to Trustee Collard's comments just recently here with uh, Superintendent Blackwell, though there may be a solution right now, I think the fact is uh, the premise of not offering the uh, testing kits to those who are um, not in person was a, a huge oversight uh, on behalf of our government. And I think that this may come uh, again, or a repeat of this oversight may come again, where those students who are online participating in online learning are treated differently. And I think to Trustee Collard's uh, comment earlier, this is a this is a huge inequity and not appropriate, uh, and it should be addressed. And I think we should proceed with a letter, even though there may be a solution. It's the whole premise, it's the whole fact that it occurred at all. And really what we're doing is to try and ward off any future such uh, oversight occurring. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gray. So, can I just respond to that? Sorry to interrupt. Um, sorry, through the chair. Uh, just, I just want to remind that trustees that when the, the rapid antigen tests were brought to us, uh, it was part of a, a test to stay, a return to school, part of a great package of strategies so that students could return to school after the break. This was prior to Omicron. Um, and it was, you know, the enhanced screening it was the antigen test throughout the break so that kids would come back uh, and, and be able to be safe in schools. And it's, it was an emphasis on trying to keep schools open. So because the initial um, design of the program, I think it's lost its the wholesome. It's, it's a part of a bigger picture. Uh, now that we're all focused on rapid antigen tests, I think the landscape's changed a bit, but it's, it's probably good to, a good food for thought. And I'm sure that uh, as we move forward in society and they'll become a, a greater part of what we're doing, I think we might see a different message. Thank you so much, Superintendent Blackwell. So where have we landed then? I'm just wanting to make sure that we don't lose pieces of recommendations or questions that came up here. So Trustee Collard, I, I understand uh, Trustee Gray's comments and I appreciate them because um, equity really has to be at the core of everything that we do. Um, however, I also know that we write a lot of letters and now knowing that there is a solution in place, I, I would be reticent to writing another letter on something that's already kind of been fixed, even though they didn't do it at the time they should have, they recognized the mistake and they fixed it. So I'm willing to give them credit for having done that um, and forego writing a letter. Although um, my, my, uh, I'm just glad that they fixed it. All right, thank you, Trustee Collard. And again, just quickly to point out, as I know um, Parliament is coming to a close, I don't, and that, this is not to say that we wouldn't write a letter, but I also think that there might be some more urgent ways of getting in touch with our representatives to voice our concerns. So I would urge uh, trustees and community members alike, if they are concerned with some of these, is to reach out directly to your local MPPs and let them know. Um, as Trustee Prevent said, it is coming up to an election year, so they might be more willingly listening to you right now. 
Um, Trustee El Harris, or sorry, Vice Chair El Harrison. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, building on the comments uh, around the rapid antigen testing and just how quickly the landscape is changing and the availability of those tests now. Uh, the, um, the press releases seem to indicate some locations would have these tests to give out while supplies last. That makes me feel like the hottest Lego kits, you know, that get sold out right away. Uh, and I, I worry about that part, but that's beside the point. Um, and the second piece is that in other locations, and I heard malls, I believe, tests would be administered on site. So I wonder if our HDSB um, have a safe holiday communications would be expanded to uh, include those as options for people? Because if it was me, I'd want to get to LCBO and get a bunch of those test kits right away. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Al Harrison. Uh, Director Ennis? Uh, thanks so much, um, Chair Shuttleworth. Uh, through you to Vice Chair Al Harrison. We will certainly take a look at our communication and I know we've already sent out some communication and we're in the process of uh, sending others. So we will see uh, what we can uh, include and incorporate uh, for the next day or two. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions around this topic? All right, Director Ennis. Thank you there? so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. We're uh, masking protocols, uh, Superintendent Taha. Uh, thank you, Director Ennis. Through you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth, to the rest of the board. Uh, in terms of our masking requirements and protocols, we continue to follow the direction of Public Health and Ministry of Education, and that is providing grade two medical masks in, in terms of uh, uh, P, uh, acceptable PPE. The N95 respirator masks are uh, uh, still deemed as a specialized PPE or, and only required for uh, aerosol generating uh, procedures. Uh, that may change, of course. We'll continue to, to monitor the direction that we are provided. And as pointed out at previous uh, board meetings, uh, N95 respirator mask requests that come to our uh, department are considered on a case by case basis. So uh, that's the update on the masking requirements. Thank you, uh, Christy Collard. Thank you, Superintendent Taha for that update. I don't need to ask my question now. All right, thank you very much. Director Edith, back to you. Thank you so much. Under the infamous other, we have uh, Superintendent uh, Nagoy will be giving us an update on courtesy seats. Thank you. And uh, as we approach the end of uh, uh, the, this half of the school year, um, we have uh, finalized the review of the courtesy seats and the communication is going out to parents uh, before uh, the end of next week. Uh, we have received about 1,600 uh, requests this year, and about a third of those uh, have been able to be accommodated. Uh, so about 500 uh, courtesy seats have been accommodated throughout uh, uh, our region, and uh, that is lower than we would do in a pre-COVID year. Uh, in a pre-COVID year, we would uh, typically have about 1,600 seats um, uh, being able to be accommodated. Uh, the reason is we are um, required to have um, feeding arrangements so we cannot load the buses at the same level that we would uh, before COVID. Uh, and also we have to provide uh, some flexibility for students that are eligible for transportation in virtual schools that may switch between models throughout the year. So as a result, we do have a lower capacity to accommodate courtesy seats, but we were able to accommodate approximately 500. And uh, communication, as I mentioned, will be sent out in the next uh, few days and will be uh, also available uh, on the HSTS website for parents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Nagoy. Uh, 
Trustee Gravitz. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I, I have heard from parents uh, about this. Uh, some are exceedingly happy. Uh, some are a little, um, they, they've been able to secure perhaps AM but not PM uh, courtesy seats. And uh, as you mentioned that, you know, some students that may be bus students uh, but are in the virtual environment and maybe switching back, if those um, courtesy seats become kind of viable, uh, during the school year, would they be reconsidered if more students, um, like if a bus stop or whatever uh, becomes available for a, a legitimate student, would the, a courtesy seat uh, then be potentially established for the PM run if, if that happens? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Thank you for that question or the, the questions. Uh, certainly, uh, we try to accommodate as many requests as possible while leaving uh, some space for the switch between models for eligible students. Um, the ones that we did uh, accommodate were not planning to, you know, in two months down the road to say, we are, sorry, we cannot offer transportation. So that's the reason why we can only look at about a third of the requests that we've received. Um, so that we can accommodate the students throughout the year. Uh, there are a few students that have uh, about 60 or so that have only either uh, AM or PM transportation. Some are by request and some potentially because of uh, uh, limitations. If we're able to accommodate more for those that are partially accommodated, uh, that is something that is on the list of uh, the uh, transportation officers to expand, not to take away the uh, courtesy seats, but to expand if they were only able to be accommodated uh, for one way, uh, for example. Um, we did the, take the precautions in place uh, so that we have that wiggle room so that the courtesy seats that have been uh, approved and are being communicated will be in place for the remainder of the year. Thank you very much. All right, I have one question for you, Director. I'm just wondering, um, what is the breakdown between primary and secondary courtesy seats? So were there more students from primary getting the courtesy? Like, was it broken down evenly or was it just luck of the draw when you applied? That is a great question. Um, I know our staff are watching. Sometimes I get text messages. I don't know the answer, the, the actual breakdown. Uh, what I can tell you is that we gave uh, preference to primary grades because they're smaller. Um, and therefore, those students that were further from uh, school and so therefore closer to the eligibility uh, barrier or um, you know stop, uh, as well as the age was a factor. Uh, and we also looked at uh, students at risk in terms of uh, not attending. So that's more for the secondary panel, I would say. So there was a mix of priority factors in order to determine those that will be eligible. But more so, if I had to guess, I would say primary grades would make up the, the most of these students. All right. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions surrounding courtesy seats? All right, thank you very much, Superintendent Nagoy. Uh, Director Ennis. Thank you, Chair Shuttleworth. Uh, we have an update on Milton number 12. I'm gonna ask Executive Officer Gaudet to speak to this item. Thank you, uh, good evening. And uh, through the chair to trustees, I'm pleased to report that we did receive uh, ministry approval to proceed uh, to construction on Milton number 12, uh, just on this past Monday, on December 13th. Unfortunately, it took 53 days uh, of our bid period, of our 60-day bid period, uh, but better late than never. Uh, so we will have our contractor uh, mobilizing to the site in early January, starting to uh, do building layouts. And I will suggest that uh, we'll work with that vendor to uh, confirm our occupancy date once we see their construction schedule as they navigate uh, the supply chain difficulties and uh, ramp up with their labor forces. Thank you, Executive, Executive Officer Gadet. Does anybody have any questions? I just have one quick one. Um, again, so, and I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. 
Um, with it taking that 53 of the 60 days, did that impact costing at all? Through the chair to the chair, we did hear some grumblings. Uh, certainly, uh, vendors do not want to hold their prices given the uncertainty and the challenges. And uh, I think we anticipated that, that at about the 30 day mark, people would start to get uncomfortable. Uh, so we, we did hear that informally. Uh, we did not receive any formal notifications, um, but certainly we'll be working with our vendor to try and ensure that any delivery issues or significant cost uh, escalations that we we try to value engineer and work with uh, our vendors to ensure that there's, uh, you know, we can deliver the product uh, similar uh, quality and uh, obviously on time. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Seeing no more questions. Director Ennis. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. I'm almost at the end. I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, HLF for their continued support for the students and families in the Halton District School Board. Uh, they reported to me that they were able to meet every single request for our funding uh, that was brought forward so far this year. So we want to thank them for their partnership and for taking care of so many of our families and students. And so that was good news that we wanted to share with you. I also want to just say we are at the end of 2021, and this is the final board meeting for the for the calendar year. And although it's not a at the end of the school year, uh, 2021, I think we would all agree, has been quite a difficult year for our students, our families, communities, and everyone involved. And to that end, I just want to say a big thanks to our trustees, to our senior staff, to our school-based staff and administrators, to every single staff who work in schools, all of our staff that work in our administrative buildings, our students, and our public health partners for helping to guide us through what has been a perhaps the most challenging year uh, we've experienced so far. So thanks to everyone. I think most cannot wait to see a uh, chapter turned to 2022. And uh, we are lo looking forward to 2022 with hope and optimism. Uh, but we are grateful for the hard work, the commitment, the dedication, the sacrifice that everyone has put forward uh, to help us get through this particular school year. So with that, I thank you. And that's my report. Thank you so much, Director Ennis. And I do too mirror your thanks to everyone. Uh, we are now up to 6.6, .6, which is communication from the chair. Attached to the agenda are four letters um, that we have previously received. One from Blue Water District looking at grade nine de-streaming, the next steps. One from MPP Arnott, who was supporting our letter to the government. Uh, one from Hamilton Wentworth District School Board, looking at funding for menstrual products. And finally, one from Toronto District School Board regarding OBSPA's OBS advocacy and recovery plan. Are there any questions or comments on those letters? Great, thank you very much. We're now up to 6.7 committee reports. Are there any committee reports for this evening? All right, thank you very much. We are now up to trustee questions and comments. Trustee Daniele. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to give a uh, shout out we as trustees, we have large networks, we know a lot of people, and we try to do the best we can for our community. But I saw this past week, one of our colleagues around the table step up and use their network in possibly the best way I've ever seen it done. I'd like to offer congratulations to trustee Heather Garretts. When everyone else was worrying about Black Friday and Cyber Monday, she was reaching out for Turkey Tuesday. And by reaching out to her connection and, and using all of the resources at hand, she was able to raise over $10,000 to provide meals for hungry families over the Christmas season. And, you know, I, all of my trustee colleagues are amazing and I love working with all of you. But this particular week, it is Trustee Garrett's. I want to be Trustee Garrett's when I grow up because she is absolutely amazing and deserves to be applauded for her commitment to the community. So thank you so much, Heather, for making sure, because I know my day job, some of my clients will be the recipients of that, and they might not otherwise have 
a turkey dinner that day. And thanks to your generosity and reaching out to your network and using all of your resources to make Christmas better for other people, I, we applaud you and commend you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Trustee Daniele. I think we all echo and applaud Trustee Garrett alongside of you. And Trustee Garrett, you're up next on the speakers list. Thank you. If uh, I could just make a comment to uh, Trustee Daniele uh, about that. Thank you for your kind words. Um, but I have to say that it is our community that rally together. I, I'm just, you know, the the one that puts it together and ends up writing the big check at the end of the day. But um, money came all the way from Germany, from Roatan, from across Canada, um, different parts of Ontario, but the majority of it came from Milton. Um, and it's for Halton families, and we're going to feed 408 um, extra families this year. So um, I, I'm proud to be part of it, uh, but I'm just a sl small cog in the wheel of this whole thing. Anyway, uh, but thank you. My question is uh, to switch gears now, and thank you through the um, is regarding um, our new high school in Milton, uh, Elsie McGill. I'm wondering if we could just get a quick update on uh, occupancy and as as well as uh, programming. Uh, uh, for example, ISTEM, where we're uh, at with that in terms of when that's going to get uh, kicked in, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you. Uh, through uh, Chair Shuttleworth, I'm going to ask Executive Officer Gadetti if he would speak to the facilities and Superintendent Newton to speak to the programming. Thank you. Uh, through the Chair to trustees uh, and pleased to report that we are working and looking at an occupancy date uh, in early January. Uh, so we do hope to get all of the inspections. I will say, though, uh, I am cautious uh, with that. I know we are struggling to even receive a couple of life safety devices, some uh, specialized fire uh, detection or smoke detection devices for the, uh, the high bay area. Um, so again, the, the supply chain continues to frustrate in, in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, very confident that uh, uh, we're in a good position from a construction perspective. We've been uh, cleaning and uh, loading uh, the classrooms with furniture from the top down and uh, yeah, hope to get rid of that dust and uh, make way for uh, the students that are going to hopefully enjoy this wonderful facility. I'll turn it over to Superintendent Newton. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Godot, um, and to the chair, to uh, Trustee Garretts. We're really excited about the programming. Um, already, uh, I think sometimes when a building's not ready, it uh, forces the focus to be on teaching and learning and not on uh, cleaning the dust. And so to that extent, the staff at Elsie McGill have been on fire in terms of offering de-streaming for all grade nine courses. Um, and it's a vibrant staff. When you go in there, they, they are really meeting the needs of our grade nine students. In terms of iSTEM, we have a dedicated person uh, at Elsie that is working with the staff at Aldershot to to bridge both programs um, with a very similar um, similar approach. And uh, they have been working um, diligently on attracting um, community partners and building a council that they hope to launch uh, early in the new year and including our post-secondary pathways, including uh, Wilfrid Laurier, Guelph University and Conestoga College. So we're really excited about those pieces. Um, I will call on uh, Superintendent Blackwell to comment on the iSTEM applications and where we're at as we launch that in September. Thank you, Superintendent Blackwell. Uh, hi, and through uh, the chair um, to the trustees, uh, we have seen a, a, a large response and excitement in terms of iSTEM in the north. I believe um, well over 300 applications for Elsie McGill. Um, and we also have, uh, again, in Aldershot, well over 200. Uh, those, there are no repetitive applications, so people had to apply to one or the other. Uh, so they're in the process right now. Uh, both staff are working together to uh, moderate those applications, go through them, 
uh, and, uh, and get some responses to our families and our students in the new year. So it's really exciting uh, and it's a good problem to have. Uh, a lot of excitement and uh, we know that as, as Superintendent Newton said, great program offerings uh, in all Milton schools, but uh, you know, uh, Elsie McGill has some other offerings as well that are, that are very, uh, very, uh, very um, innovative and ready to go. So it will be a good experience for sure. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Rocha. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I, I heard that we had over 300 applications for ISTEM and Elsie McGill. Could you just refresh me on the number for uh, the Burlington location and how many spots will actually be available in either location? Uh, so through the chair uh, to Trustee Rocha, just over 200. I, we don't have the exact numbers. I think we met uh, just before the, the final deadline. So we were over 200 at that point. Uh, the spots are 120, approximately 120 for each site. Thank you, sorry. Uh, Trustee Oliver. Thank you. Through your chair to um, to the director, just want to share with you um, an email that I received from a parent in my area. Um, it's it's expresses a disappointment with um, and concern around communications pertaining to um, um, safety issues. So there was a situation in two neighboring schools that required um, uh, sec hold and secure at one of the schools and the parents found out through about the situation through tweets from the Halton Regional Police as well as another neighboring school that was affected um, and they heard nothing from their own school so as you can imagine you know hours went by and and they were hearing these these um, um, comments and notices from other sources but not from their own school and so they were very um, upset by that. They understand that there are protocols and procedures to follow and that HDSB has its own uh, guidelines around communications relating to hold and secure and, uh, and such measures. But um, I'm, this parent is, is wondering if, um, you know, if, if these policies need to be revisited in light of um, the growing, you know, um, social media presence and anybody being able to post uh, post information out there, um, we don't want the parents that are affected in those schools to be the last ones to know. So I wonder if I could hear from you um, about that. Thank you. Director Ennis. Thanks, Chair Shuttleworth. Uh, through you, I'm gonna ask uh, Superintendent Roger Barrick if he would uh, speak to, to this. I threw the chair to uh, Trustee Oliver and, and all trustees. Our, our communications uh, for any hold and secure or lockdown, we do communicate. It's generally upon um, conclusion, which isn't in the real time that some people demand. Um, we have reconsidered it uh, a number of times. Um, part, part of our consideration of, of staying with our post communication is um, there's very little we can do. The last thing we want during hold and secure is people flooding to the school site itself, parents coming to pick up, the doors are locked, we're not letting you in. It actually has potential to make it a lot worse than better. Um, hold and secure, the kids are, uh, they are safe. There is no imminent risk to, to the school. Um, it, it's just you generally a community issue. We don't want people out and about. Um, so we ask people to stay away. That is why the uh, police are tweeting out to the general public is to say, basically stay away from that area. Uh, there's something going down at that point. So our communications are consistent. They always follow up later. It, it's probably not as timely as some would like, but there's very little, um, there's very little to gain from doing it in real time. Um, and so we've, we've considered that many times and we, we, we tend to land where we do. Um, 
It's also very difficult during a hold and secure um, and almost impossible during a lockdown to liaise effectively with uh, police and the school staff themselves to put together messaging. Um, they're usually quite busy um, occupied within the building. So I'm not sure that would help uh, the parent or please them, but that that is indeed our rationale for, for doing it after. But there's always a communication that goes out from the school um, as soon after as we can. Do you have a follow-up, Prince Oliver? Yes, I do. Um, so if it is the case that there were communications coming out from police and neighboring schools um, I would assume that there is some kind of an agreement on who communicates what. Is there perhaps an opportunity for all the stakeholders to discuss how to, to manage that better um, so that, you know, one school is not talking about what's happening at another school and the police who have their own, you know, instructions and directives uh, are not saying, you know, saying that as well. So I'm just wondering if that's there's an opportunity to be explored there with the partners. There is an opportunity. Um, and we, we do talk with police around that centrally. Different detachments actually have different Twitter accounts. Um, so you have Oakville, uh, Milton, Halton Hills, and, and they have different levels of, of activity on their local Twitters, um, which um, is, some, is sometimes a challenge because it's not always their central communication department like ours putting it. Um, their, their tweets are a little more localized in terms of police. We do meet with um, uh, our coterminous board, Halton Catholic, around this as well. Um, a, a, again, we, we there are frequently around, especially on hold and secures, there are intersections where two or three schools could be in a hold and secure. One could be... Uh, Alton Catholic School too could be uh, HDSB sites. We we try to get it uh, aligned, um, but ultimately it's they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, they they do a little bit more of a real time um, on social media. Um, most of our families aren't following our social media. That's the other thing. Uh, our school messenger gets virtually every parent. Uh, Twitter is just a small a very small portion of our parents who happen to be following, uh, it is a minority. So we choose to do the one communication to all our families after the fact. Um, the Halton Catholics approach is, is a little different and police is, is more of a community safety message rather than to our parents. So they're all, they're all a, a little bit different. We do meet annually to discuss this. Um, it sometimes feels like we're going back and doing our, our own things though. Time. Thank you very much. Um, are there any more questions? And if not, I'm going to circle back to Trustee Oliver and look at uh, somebody putting a motion forward to maybe suspend the rules and then we can discuss the motion. Vice Chair Harrison. Oh, and Trustee Gray, we'll go for Trustee Gray first. Oh, are you? I just, yeah, sorry, thank you through the chair. If you're looking for a motion to suspend the rules, I would uh, so move, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we need a seconder for this or just a motion? Seconder? Uh, trust, or Vice Chair Al Harrison, would you like to second that motion? Can do, thank you. Awesome. So if everybody will turn to their voting chart to look at suspending the rules to discuss a motion this evening. Uh, Trustee Amos. Um, is there an urgency to pass this um, before the next meeting? Um, I'm just wondering, because it was a notice of motion, it can come to in the board package as a motion next week or two so weeks. It would be after Christmas. And, yeah. after well, Christmas. I'm just asking, is there an urgency to have this done do, before then? I mean, no, normally a notice of motion comes forward and it then it goes forward to the next meeting. So I'm just asking, is there an urgency to waive the rules to um, do this? 
All right, Trustee Collard. Well, I wouldn't say that it's urgent. I would say that it's timely because as time passes, um, it loses the the sense of importance. And uh, I do believe strongly that um, OFSA needs to understand that the way they conducted um, themselves regarding their own error uh, was less than savory. All right, so I, th I think then in answer to Trustee Amos's question, um, and I think what we had discussed earlier that we had just put it in the wrong place because although notice of motion is for a motion that would come back to the board, bringing it up under trustees questions and comments with a suspension of the rule allows for the, us to deal with it immediately. So that's how we're wanting to proceed. I am seeing nods from trustee Oliver. So again, so it's kind of, we're still in the middle of voting. If you are in favor or against suspending the rules to have this motion discussed and passed this evening. And that passes unanimously. Wonderful. So trustee, Oliver, I know the motion has been circulated amongst trustees, so I didn't know if you wanted to maybe guide a conversation. Or did anybody have any questions or comments for Trustee Oliver? Maybe mm -hmm. uh, Vice Chair Ella Harrison. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, and to trustee colleagues and to Director Ennis. Um, as I was thinking about this uh, this afternoon, I think one of the difficulties that I've had is just how this kind of intersects between operational and governance. Uh, and it's a little unclear as to where that fits exactly. I am grateful to Trustee Oliver for um, getting us and keeping us rolling and getting us to this state. And I fully support writing a letter. My question is whether uh, Director Ennis would entertain uh, co-signing such a letter uh, just to indicate that it is a collaborative piece between the governance and operational. Because I, when I looked to OSA to try and find, uh, you know, a governance uh, group to direct this to. Um, it's largely made up of staff from different school boards. So that's where this request is coming from at the last minute. Thank through you, Dr. Ernest. Thank you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. Uh, through you to Vice Chair L. Harrison. I certainly would be open to the idea of um, being a signature to this letter uh, to OFSA. I know that both uh, Associate Director Bogue and Superintendent Barnes uh, did a tremendous follow-up on behalf of our school and our students who were uh, negatively impacted by this event. Uh, we thought it was um, quite unfortunate, and we certainly would not like to see this repeated uh, for any of our students. So I'd be happy to sign. Thank you, Director Ennis. Um, Ella questions or comments, you had a chance to read through the motion that Vice Chair, or sorry, no, that Trustee Oliver shared with everyone. Uh, Trustee Grants. Thank you. Just wondering if anybody should be CC'd on this. Uh, Trustee, or sorry, Vice Chair L. Harrison. There was two hands up. I defer to Trustee Oliver. No, okay, I was going to mention then in terms of copies, uh, it could go to or should probably go to GHAC, the uh, local organization, the board's athletic coordinator, uh, as well as to uh, other, other boards. And Superintendent Barnes, I see you've popped on. I don't know if you have any other suggestions as to who this letter should be copied to. Uh, 
Um, through the chair to the chair. I, I believe um, what you've mentioned is appropriate and I've notified our local GHAC uh, contacts. There's a few administrators and the uh, coordinator, Karen Kurz, they've been informed. So I think to CC them, that would be appropriate. Great, thank you so much for your input. Um, Trustee Gray, your hand was up, but it's gone down. I don't know, has your question been answered? Yes, it has. I would have. Uh, I would concur with uh, the comments of uh, Superintendent Barnes. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Trustee Oliver. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair, to uh, to everyone, I guess. Um, further to uh, Tracy L. Harrison's uh, point, uh, we did kind of struggle with that uh, the 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 blend of operations and governance. And so um, uh, I'm grateful that, that the director is willing to co-sign the letter. I think that's very important. And I appreciate uh, the input that we received from, from a number of senior staff here um, around you know, the messaging and um, making sure that we had our facts and, and uh, in, in that, that went into the motion itself. So um, I thank everybody for that and all the trustees who were able to provide comments. All right, great, thank you very much, Trustee Oliver. Um, so do we need to re read the motion? We've raised the rules, but we still need to vote on the motion. So Vice Chair Harrison. Yes, so I believe it's friendly amendments, Trustee Oliver, that I've added in. Um, something, I've added in something that I'm going to let everybody know about here. Um, letter to be co-signed by the director. Uh, and then also with copies to the Halton Athletic Coordinator, GHAC and Ontario DSBs. And if I knew what GHAC stood for right off the top of my head, I would write it oh, out in proper Golden fashion. Golden Horseshoe. Golden Horseshoe Athletic, Athletic Council. There you go. Okay, I'll, I'll write it out. Uh, co conference, athletics conference. I'll write it out properly. <laughs> All right, Trustee Roche, I see you've popped up, but no hand or just, you're just here to say hello. Awesome. All right, um, okay, so then I guess, are we moving forward with the motion do you want, I don't know, do we need to read it again? I think it might be helpful just because it was quite some time ago and people hadn't had a chance to read it. And so, I know there was a, mo a mover, was there a seconder? We, ha we have not moved and seconded this motion yet. We've only done the um, waiving of the rules. So we'll have to come back because I think it was a vice, oh, sorry, trustee Oliver was looking at moving and vice chair L. Harrison was looking at seconding, second, seconding it. But Trustee Oliver, do you have a copy with the amendments made by Vice Chair L. Harrison? I will just, con through you Chair, I will just con confirm that uh, Trustee L. Harrison is making the revisions within the, um, within our Q&A doc? Correct. Thank you. Okay, and they are all complete. So I'm ready to go. Okay. Great, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Whereas the Thomas A. Blakelock High School, TAB, AA girls basketball team was offered additional entry into the November 19, 2021 Ontario Federation of School Athletic Associations, OFSA, basketball championship. And whereas OFSA advised TAB coaches the team's additional entry was made an error on part of the OFSA, on, sorry, on the part of OFSA, subsequently resulting in a last-minute withdrawal of TAB from the OFSA Basketball Championship Tournament. And whereas the news of the withdrawal of TAB from the OFSA Basketball Championship had a significant negative impact on the members of the team at a time when all students have endured countless pandemic-related challenges. And whereas OFSA holds a critical provincial role related to excellence in student sport, which is reflected in its vision to be a leader in the development of the student well-being and its mission to foster student access and enrich education through school sport. 
and whereas OFSA indicated that its constitution, bylaws, and operating procedures presented barriers to allowing Thomas A. Blakelock to continue in the provincial tournament. Therefore, be it resolved that the HDSB direct the chair to write a letter to be co-signed by the direct director to the acting executive director of OFSA to request that OFSA review its constitution, bylaws, and operating procedures and make any necessary revisions to ensure that a process exists to enable expedient remedies of any future errors by the organization that negatively impact student dignity and well-being, with copies to the Halton Athletic Coordinator, Golden Horseshoe Athletic Conference, and Ontario District School Boards. And that OFSA demonstrate upholding its own vision and mission by providing transparency in this review process by conveying any resulting changes to member schools so that the Halton District School Board students, staff, and community can be confident that this negative experience resulted in positive change for all student athletes and those that support them. And I so move. Thank you so much. So Trustee Oliver has moved. Trustee L. Harris, sorry, Vice Chair L. Harrison, would you like to second that motion? Yes. With All thanks. Right. Awesome. Are there any questions or comments before we turn to vote on this motion, please? All right, seeing none, if you will cast your votes, please. We are missing one, I think it's Trustee Vidilankara still here. She left already, thank you. Okay, so then that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So uh, I will open up a Google Doc to create a letter and have wonderful collaboration from us all in crafting a beautiful letter. Thank you so much, Trustee Oliver. All right, are there any other questions or comments from trustees before we move on? Great, thank you so much. We're now on to public questions. Um, so in order to ask a question, you can use the button on the live stream page of the HDSB website, or use the link at the bottom of tonight's agenda. Questions posed during live stream meetings of the Board of Trustees may be answered during the meeting, particularly those related to agenda items or at the following meeting at the discretion of the chair. For efficiency, multiple questions received that are similar in nature may be grouped together at the discretion of the chair and or vice chair. Questions will not be attributed. When necessary, a notation will be made that multiple people ask the same question. Any question that contains language that is hateful or discriminatory will not be considered. Vice Chair Al Harrison, do we have any questions submitted this evening? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes, we do have um, two, it's a two-parter from uh, one individual related to the school year calendar report. All right, thank you. Would you like to read those questions for us, please? Okay, uh, sure thing. Okay. Report 21158 notes that the committee includes parents from each region. Is there any policy item that ensures fair and diverse representation of creeds, religions, cultures? Which parents are eligible? Uh, and uh, yes, which parents are eligible and what is the process for applying to be part of the calendar committee? And then the second piece is um, a comment a contextual comment, um, just pointing out one statement in the report that says diversity and intersectionality of identity in public education implies that no single identity should set the standards for others. So that's a quote from the report. And the person who wrote in says this sounds ideal, but the truth is that one identity 
in fact, sets the standards for others, and therein lies the barrier to inclusion and representation. Our school board is centered around the Christian holiday calendar. This is not something that can be easily changed, but greater representation on calendar and other committees is one way to ensure that the aims of this statement are honored. Um, and the person just requests that we uh, uh, address and identify this and uh, want it to be on record um, because the board does aim to improve its inclusion and diversity practices. Thank you, Vice Chair Al Harrison. So I'm just looking to the questions and I think there were, I don't know, are the questions from the first part of that answerable? I, I see Director Ennis. Oh, thank you, Chair Shuttleworth. I believe that both uh, Associate Director Bolg and Superintendent Etoff uh, can provide some context uh, to the question. Thanks, uh, Director Ennis, and three, Madam Chair, two uh, trustees, and two, our, our question um, raiser. Uh, and thank you for that question. It, it's uh, there, there's two of them there. They're both kind of intertwined. So I think I'll I'll maybe start, and Superintendent Etoff will will fill in the gaps uh, for me if I if I've missed something for sure. Um, just around the um, the representation of different faith communities on the calendar committee, I I just. I wanted to note that there is some practical, uh, from a practical perspective, it is a bit challenging. We have multiple, multiple different faith groups out there. We have a calendar committee with um, 35 to 40 uh, members typically on the committee right now. And um, it would be a bit of a challenge to include all different faith groups. And what if we didn't have each and every faith group there? I just, I would worry a little bit about that. Um, from uh, the perspective of parents on the committee, just so that folks are clear, we do have we do ask for parent representation. We ask for uh, parents from each geographic area in the board, and uh, that request goes out through our PIC committee. So there is an opportunity for um, for parents to participate, and it's important to have that parent voice uh, certainly at the committee. Uh, we want our calendar to be sort of family friendly, if you will. Uh, issues around daycare, around where P, uh, P, PD days are placed. Sometimes there are questions around where the winter or March break holiday uh, aligns, and there are questions around transportation issues and so on. So it's good to have that parent voice. We, we do value the, um, and, uh, and need to understand where those particular faith days lie within the school year. Um, that's uh, certainly a really, really important to us, and we have um, our days of significance calendar so that we can track and we know where those days uh, land. We have our human rights and equity advisor on our committee as well as our representation from our equity department and that's usually Superintendent Etoff or the system principal for equity so that they can help us with those days. It's really important for us to understand how days of significance might have a imp uh, significant impact on student learning and well-being and I'll give you a couple of quick examples. For example, if there's a faith day during our exam block in our in our secondary schools, we may not have a lot of flexibility around where that exam block lies because there are some restrictions around it being near the end of the semester and so on. But we would certainly ensure that uh, the appropriate reminders and messaging goes out so that we can accommodate kids who are celebrating their faith and need to have their exam uh, day moved, for example. Um, I can think of other examples where kids are um, uh, fasting, for example, at a particular time of the year. And so it would be good for us to understand that so that we're not planning uh, large events with food or uh, events with physical activities in our school so that appropriate accommodations can occur. So those are the kinds of things that we, we do want to think about when we're looking at where faith days are and, and how we can provide appropriate accommodations. Um, typically around the PD day planning, um, it's not something where we really, um, where we typically would look to aligning PD days with faith days. I know that did come up last year. It's important for us that our staff can participate on PD days. Those are work days for our staff. There are required learning uh, that our staff participate in on PD days um, as directed by the Ministry of Education, as well as our own learning um, aimed at moving forward the multi-year strategic plan. 
and we want our system to kind of uh, move forward together and have a coherence. And so it's really important that all of our staff are there on those days. So in fact, we try to avoid faith days uh, when we're planning the um, uh, the location of our PD days. And it's important to plan those PD days and spread them out over the year so that uh, strategically so that we can maximize our staff's learning. Um, I'll just look to Superintendent Etoff to see if there's um, some other pieces that maybe he may want to add. And um, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, you, Superintendent Etoff. Uh, thanks very much, Associate uh, uh, Director Bogue. Uh, I think you've covered most of uh, most of the points that I would make. Uh, I, I think the only additional piece that I would mention is um, with respect to um, uh, the uh, the individual who's brought the questions forward and um, you know wanting to look at, uh, at at representation of the committee. Uh, as we found out uh, with our with our student census and our staff census this past year. Um, it's uh, it's really reinforced for us that that there are um, uh, very few um, individuals uh, in our system um, that that would have kind of a single notion of identity. So, um, uh, you know, we take you know individuals, and if we look at things like faith and religion, um, that uh, we have um, uh, many different faiths, you know, comprising uh, a single household. So, uh, students identifying. Um, as a, as a Sikh, uh, but also Hindu, uh, as you know, as well. So I think we just need to, you know, acknowledge the intersectionality uh, of identity um, and how that plays out. And even within identities, uh, you know, uh, we look at those who who practice uh, uh, who practice the Hindu faith. Um, there are, there are very much regional differences in the days of particular ex uh, significance uh, that they observe. So, um, you know, having that kind of representation around a table, to be quite honest, I'm not sure is, uh, is possible. And, and that's why uh, uh, we lean on those uh, who, bring that, uh, um, uh, who bring that knowledge uh, and who bring that experience um, and uh, also rely on our policies and procedures of the board, in, in, in including our equity and inclusive policy, uh, as well as some of our frameworks that, that guide our, deci uh, our decision making um, and, uh, and help inform our decision making, uh, such as uh, our particular days of significance resource document, which um, it, it is not a comprehensive document. It does not identify uh, every single um, uh, uh, faith day. Um, it, it is not a days of significance, uh, a calendar per se, but it's particular days. So those days um, uh, for, you know, I, I guess simplicity's sake, uh, we can almost refer to as the high holy days um, and uh, days that we really need to be uh, cognizant of uh, when we're looking at uh, uh, less so in terms of our calendar building, but more so in, in particular of, of planning particular events, activities, things within our control, um, uh, within our schools, uh, and across the system. So I think that's uh, an additional piece, I think, that hopefully helps uh, answer and respond to the question at hand. Thank you, um, Superintendent Ita and Associate Director. Um, Director Ennis, could I just ask for clarification on one more piece of that question? Uh, the final part of that question was they asked was which parents are eligible and what is the process for applying to be a part of the calendar committee? And I think that might be of interest to our wider community as well. I don't know um, if Director Ennis, you can give us some insight on that, please. Associate Director Bogue spoke to this earlier about the uh, process through PIC. Uh, would you like to just reiterate that for us, uh, Associate Director Bogue? Sure, thanks, uh, Director Ennis. Yeah, it is through PIC. Our PIC for parents out there, if they're not familiar, is our Parent uh, Involvement Committee. And we have representation across the board on that committee. And so the, the request goes out through that committee and we are looking for uh, geographic representation from each um, area of the board and parents just need to uh, reach out and let us know who they are. And if we get overwhelmed with uh, responses, we may have to do a bit of a draw or something like that, but uh, it, an expression of interest is all that's needed. Great, thank you so much. I just thought that might be nice to sort of end it off with. Thank you very much for your input. Um, Vice Chair Harrison, are there any other questions from the public? No. Great. 
Um, so for you all out there, there's several ways to be heard by the Board of Trustees about your questions or concern regarding governance and policy at the Halton District School Board. This question and answer portion of the meeting, delegating to the board and reaching out directly to your local trustee. Trustee contact details are available on the HDSB website. All right, and that brings us to 7.0, which is our adjournment. So as both Director Ennis pointed out, I did meet in our last meeting with I want to take this opportunity to wish our students, staff, family, and communities a wonderful holiday season. I hope you're all able to take time to unwind, spend time with those you love, and have a relaxing break. We really do appreciate all the hard work, support, and care that has made this extraordinary school year as successful as it has been able to be. We have exhausted not only our agenda, but ourselves, and I declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>